Good evening. A question was asked about how to deal with those aspects of belief that we don't know are still operating in us. And it's a very good question. Because despite our best efforts in truth and then in silence, so that we can experience the truth of being actually living itself as us, things happen. And those things, and we are unfortunately trained to focus on the bad end of the pairs of opposites, and so those things are normally something of discord or illness, disease, accident, lack, disappointment, that which appeared to be happening, suddenly not happening, and therefore leaving us bereft of our supply or our relationship or our place or our home or whatever it may be. Life seems to take us by surprise sometimes. And or we find ourselves insufficiently motivated to continue to work in the fields of truth, and yet we want to, but something keeps distracting us. There's not enough of an impulse happening as us. And so on and so on. There's a lot of experience that we really have no conscious awareness of, and then suddenly we're face to face with it, and we wonder why. First of all, is God at all unaware or unconscious? Does God have a subconscious? Absolutely no. Does God have an unconscious? Absolutely no. Does God even sleep at night? Absolutely no. Is God forever a millisecond in eternity unaware of the fullness of itself as infinity, as omnipresence, as eternity? Of course, absolutely not. So, right there we realize that any experience we're having is nothing at all to do with God or an aspect of truth, but is to do with, guess what, the personal sense of self. Only the believed self has what it is believed an unconscious or a subconscious. Only the believed sense of being can be unaware of anything at all. Only the believed sense of being can be surprised by any of experience. God isn't surprised. God already knows what's around every corner. Himself, herself, itself, and the fullness thereof, that being only good and joy and truth and love, as all awareness and form. So all of these aspects of experience that surprise us are of the personal sense of self. Therefore, they are nothing real. Now, there is a quick way into truth and there is a very slow way into truth. And most of us, including me, decided subconsciously to take the slow way into truth. But... Now that I'm a little there, a grain of me is there, I can tell you that it's perfectly obvious to me, in hindsight, how I could have at any time taken the quick way into truth. And so let me share this with you, because you may be interested in taking the quick way to truth. The quick way into truth is to ignore yourself. Anything that comes up about your 
experience isn't true. First of all, everything, everything without exception that you can detect as being your experience, first of all, is local. Second of all, has a name on it. Third of all, as you look over your fence, you can find out that your neighbour hasn't got the same things going on in his or her experience. They've got their own problems, but they also have nothing to do with you. Third of all, a temporal. Fourth of all, you can probably, there are certainly a billion methods out there from which to choose, but you can probably find some way of at least tempering everything that you can name that's holding you back, slowing you down, untruthful. And that's because it exists only in and of the pairs of opposites, which is itself the personal sense of self. And we could probably go on, but you catch the point that everything of yourself is nothing to do with truth. So we can entertain ourselves, and the ego loves to do that. It loves to, being the very devil itself, suggest to us that it is in fact not only very important to entertain everything going on with us and try and figure it out, but it has ways all ready for us to become involved with everything to do with the self. So, the slow way of truth is to carry on entertaining oneself. Good or bad. Being concerned about even these things which we haven't yet understood, haven't yet even known about or seen, and therefore surprise us. And these things do happen while we're still in the pairs of opposites. We think everything is great. We think we've lifted sufficiently and we're feeling truth and we're feeling very pleased with ourselves and confident about truth. And then something hard comes up, completely unexpected. I have emails about them. I don't want to name any of the emails I I have, but someone or something is lost. An opportunity runs from our experience that looked just exactly what we needed in every way, including in the way of supply or the way of opportunity or something we've been working on for years has collapsed right at the point of its seeming fruition. Or we suddenly discover disease in our body somewhere. We thought we were just free and able now to get on with expressing truthfully. And we even have an idea what that is. And then disease is discovered in our body. And we're down in hell. We're down at the starting point again. Or our relationship seems to not be getting better but worse and then walks out on us. Or, or, or. All the catastrophes of experience we could list, uh, many of them hitting up at us completely unexpected. All of this is to do with the personal self. Most of the pairs of opposites aren't visible to us. We don't know their operation, their ways, their works. We don't know how close they are to our experience. If we did, we could be prepared. But so many things, as we're living in the pairs of opposites, come up and surprise us and perhaps delay us, knock us down, make us lose our faith that we actually have been making progress in truth. So you see, the slow way is to continue to be concerned about these things and try to understand them. We'd love to understand them because we think in understanding them we can be free of them. 
<clears throat> or at least see them coming over the horizon so that we're prepared. But the pairs of opposites don't work like that. Remember, again, there is only one presence, only one thing happening actually. And remember again that we can't have it one way and not the other way. So we are told in Scripture, are we not? No signs will be given. If we expect that to be true of truth but not of the pairs of opposites, we're mistaken. Very, very often those signs are given of our impending injury or our impending illness, disease, the walking out of our love, the sudden running away of supply, just like that butterfly we heard of the other night. Everything of truth seems to run away from us, not be there, especially when and where we need it. So the first thing, if you want to get on that straight and narrow path, which is also a fast path, is to drop the personal self. And no one's suggesting it's easy, but there is a way of it as well. So let's maybe hear some ways of doing this in very practical terms. All we can do, and in fact all that's happening, is a living moment by moment. There's nothing more than this moment, even though our sense of it again may suggest that there is. There isn't. There is only now, and we're experiencing now, moment by moment. Literally, step by step, breath by breath, there's our experience. And right there is a clue as to how to experience more and more truth, and that's If we're in truth, if our attention is in and on and being truth moment by moment, then moment by moment is ever more truthful. But because we're only living moment by moment, we can only deal with life moment by moment. And the best way of dealing with this little vagabond, the personal self, who is actually nothing, just a shadow, like Jesse's shadow, following us around as a body of belief, the best way is to detect the moments throughout every 24 hours where we are thinking personally, locally, corporeally, materially. We're accepting something of the appearing experience of life. It might just be mental. We're thinking something of our own self or our own experience. So the moment we're either thinking finitely, corporeally, materially, or we're thinking in terms of I, me, mine, Anything to do with I, me, mine, or my world interpretation, is the moment we can catch ourselves and force our thinking into truth. So moment by moment we're weakening the strength suggestion has on our experience. And that's how to do it. It's a moment by moment resolve to stop the entertainment of belief, which entertains itself in us and as us if we allow it to. Remember, you are not belief. You are not your mind. You're not even your experience. The only you there is is infinite, omnipresent, universal, eternal, Therefore, the only belief there is, the only, even if it so very much seems as if it's your problem you're experiencing, or your makeup, your past coming up and troubling you again, it isn't. It's collective belief, the one collective belief. It's never yours and never can be, because the you that it could be yours of doesn't exist.
if we see a patch of sunlight on the wall, nothing of that patch has anything to do with what appears as its being, its body. What we're witnessing, despite appearance, is the one universal sun happening to be in our experience as this patch of light. But that patch of light is pure illusion if we believe it to be anything of its own self, a being, a body, an activity, a type, a category, a quality of its own self. It has nothing to do with its own self because its own self isn't its own self. It is the one universal sun that we're experiencing this moment as what appears to be local, finite, of a certain quality and condition. Good or bad. It's very bright or it's very dim. It's pure, brilliant light or it's coloured. It's grey or dark blue or dark brown because it's coming through a stained glass window. None of this is true of it. In fact, it is only in our experience, no matter what we think it is, and what we think it's made of, or what we think its experience is, because of the sun. If the sun weren't there, this local experience couldn't be here. And if God wasn't here, you couldn't be here, and I couldn't be here. None of our experience could be here. So do you see the folly of ever believing, now that we know it, anything at all that is finite, local, personal, temporal, good or bad? Even what appears as bad, even the worst of the bad of experience, couldn't be here in experience if it weren't for God. Because God is the only presence the only thing happening. But we are terrible interpreters. Anything says boo and we believe it. It's embarrassing when we watch human beings about their day. They believe anything. And so don't believe anything about yourself. If you do, if you catch yourself entertaining I, me, mine, or out into the magnified experience, anything of materiality, locality, temporality, finiteness, anything with a name, then all you're doing is giving yourself a heck of a long journey into truth. That's the long and winding road that way. And unfortunately, because only one thing is happening, the long and winding road winds around eternity. It's a very long and winding road, and that's the one we've all been on all these eternities. But if we wish to get off that one and get on the straight and narrow, which really is get into now, get into oneness, right away, step from all suggested experience, step from belief, right into oneness. Leave belief alone. Leave yourself alone. Walk away from yourself. You can't witness truth. Only God is truth. You can't witness truth for you. Only God is truth. You can't get God to do anything for you that you're not equally wanting done for the whole race of beings, the whole of the infinite. You can't resolve any question you have about you unless you wish to resolve the whole of the human question, and that's what we're about. The whole of the human question is resolved the moment we realise it is built of belief. It exists as belief. And so the moment, again, we know that and then walk away from belief, not trying to fix it or harmonize it or pacify it, not even trying to understand it, 
What's the point? It's nothing. It's like the sun trying to understand a shadow. What's the point? Or again, it's like Marconi and all his peers. When his peers were trying to understand the resistance in the atmosphere that he knew didn't actually exist. So they were wasting their time. He didn't bother. He just got on with transmitting his radio waves and discovered then or was able to prove then that the atmosphere had no resistance and therefore there was no counter-resistance technology required. The resistance didn't exist. So walk away from belief altogether. Don't even be interested in it. Don't even say goodbye, I've found his best. You're saying goodbye to nothing. And walk right into oneness. Now get on with the Father's business. Get on with the business of oneness. And as you do that, you're discovering the truth of God. And as you discover the truth of God, you discover the truth of self. And the truth of self never did have belief in it. Belief was never a part of self. Being rid of the personal sense of self means being rid of every friend as you've known them, every family member as you've known them, everything, every place, every condition as you've known them. Forget about a mount. A mount has no place in truth. Forget about the ways of business, the ways of generating dollars, forget about what you thought you had to do in order to generate dollars. All of this is of belief, which is the personal self. Did Jesus have to do something to witness sufficient food to feed the thousands? Did he have to get a part-time job? Did he have to call someone? Did he have to do something materially in order to trigger the activity of food coming up the hills there for the people? No. Why would you need to trigger omnipresence? It's already here. You can't be separated and nor can anyone or any place or condition from the whole fulfilment of itself. The very him or her or place or condition or activity is itself the whole of God, inseparable and indivisible and always in full formation. So whatever that formation appears to be in experience is actually, despite appearance, fulfilled always. Remember that enclosed body of water. So you wouldn't need a part-time job or a full-time job or have to trigger some activity somewhere in order to bring that which is already here, here. And so you see, belief runs deep and wild because we have categories of belief that are, for some of us, more easy to believe in truth. It's always been funny to me how most can, most at least who've lifted sufficiently, can believe, it's more than belief, can accept the healing of the body. Whatever seems to be wrong with the body, they can accept that by calling their practitioner who's on the other side of the world or on the other side of town or doesn't matter where, can receive their healing by being in that one's consciousness without anything material happening. And yet when it comes to dollars, they can't accept that dollars can be there without anything material happening. 
funny, isn't it? So what is that but belief? God is what you are. The whole of God fully embodied is what you are already. Closer than your breathing. The whole formation of the kingdom of God, the finished kingdom of God, which is the finished kingdom of you eternally, which means that there isn't a single grain of anything missing from your experience and your place here and now. You're standing on holy ground. There isn't any other ground on which you can be standing. The whole finished kingdom of you is fully existent and already demonstrated for you. It's a finished kingdom that's been given to us. Experience or life is the gift of God. It's actually the very presence of God. But let's realize in experience it's the gift of God. God continually seeks the fulfillment of experience. Seeks you, gives to you. As what? As some invisible, far away, impractical truth about you? No. As the very whole universe of you. There is no such thing as unembodied God. Unmanifested God. Undemonstrated God. Impractical God. How can omnipresence be impractical? If it's the only presence... And it's the only life and the only body, only being, only world. Well, that all seems very practical to me. And particularly because it's already finished, that's even more practical. And this is the truth. So you're not lacking dollars and you're not lacking any function of your body. They're the same thing. Only belief says they're different things. And because your organs and functions, your body is eternal and infinite, that means everything of you is eternal and infinite. So, anything you wish to name is eternal and infinite. Dollars are eternal and infinite. And eternity is always fulfillment in experience. Wherever we go or look, what we're observing is fulfillment. It doesn't matter what our interpretation of it is. Actually, it is fulfillment. You can't be lacking anything. Not even a breath. Because a breath is of your experience at this moment. So you have an infinity of them. And nothing can hinder them because there isn't anything but God as experience. And God is fulfillment. And nothing but. Besides fulfillment, there is none else. Well, breathing is quite fulfilling at this point of our experience, and so you can't be lacking breath. A vital, strong body is quite fulfilling at this level of experience, and so you can't be lacking a vital, strong body. It's impossible. You can interpret incorrectly and then be having an experience that's lacking vital and strong body, but that's just interpretation. But all the while you're having it, your vital and strong true body is standing right there. But you've dropped out into belief, so now you have to live belief in experience. But if you will live oneness and forget about your personal sense of body, again, you see, the experience of body we have, if we take it personally, is altogether an experience of belief. Altogether, every which way we look at it and experience it, it's 100% belief. And all you have to do to prove that is see one other person in your world and you'll see that they have a different looking body. There it is. So both those bodies must be of a personal sense because the one body that is God is exactly that, one body. Not different body. And that one body is one nurse. So we don't discover our truthful body until we've forgotten about the personal sense of body completely. Well, I shouldn't say completely, but really we don't have any concern about it. Our concern is its truth, which is oneness. 
And we love the fact that it looks unique in our experience. It's a wondrous thing, but we're not concerned about it. It's not our job to maintain it. Its life has nothing to do with our maintaining life or our understanding life. We can't understand life. Our part in experience is coming to and staying in oneness. With no understanding, I may as well give up trying to understand life because I can't understand life because life is God. Now if there is understanding to have at this moment or day of experience, then I will find myself filled with it. And that understanding will be my interpretation, which is automatic, I'm not involved in interpreting, but I will find myself filled with the interpretation that is perfect for this moment or this day in my family, or in my relationship, or in my work, or for my community, or my world. It'll be perfect, and it never will have been known in the world before. Or I may find myself filled with wisdom that's never been realized before. It's never been in the world before, like that little new bud on the tree, and the leaves and the flower and the fruit. It's never been in the world before, nor has this aspect or body of wisdom And yet here I am filled with it. Why and how? Because I've been in oneness and I've only been concerned about staying in oneness. And most importantly, once I'm there, I know that I'm ready to be still and experience God happening as the whole of me. And because I'm satisfied with that experience and because I love it more than anything else I can love, Now I find myself, moment by moment, filled with the interpretation of it, which is momentary, which is perfect for this day, or this activity, or this person, or this question, or this teaching. But I haven't been seeking for it of its own self, because I couldn't. It of its own self isn't what it appears to be. It is actually God. And if I'm concerned with getting to and staying in and being satisfied with God alone, then I find myself full of, as a surprise, full of God, which is looking like the fulfillment of this very moment. And that fulfillment, again, don't introduce belief that separates it and divides it and tries to say this over here is different from that over there. It doesn't matter whether it's a body of wisdom or knowledge or a body of dollars or a healed heart or lung or leg or whatever it may be, head. Oneness, oneness, oneness is where God is, what God is and how God is experienced as mind as form as thought as wisdom as knowledge as love as the miracle of life so there it is moment by moment catch yourself every time you start analyzing you Wondering why, how, how could this happen to me? Nothing's happening to you. You know, I didn't see a flicker of disappointment on Jesse's face when he found that beautiful shadow and laid down in it and discovered that it was no longer there. I didn't see him saying to himself, don't you just know it? How could this happen to me? Just as I found myself a beautiful shadow, now it's gone. Because he doesn't have belief. He's living is. He soon got up and moved, but that's a different thing.
He wasn't disappointed. He just got up and moved. You see, the animal kingdom really gives us truth much more than humans ever can. Just watch nature, watch animals. They're living in is. They don't examine. They don't consider, they don't believe. They just get on with moment by moment life. So get on with moment by moment God. Which means, as we've heard in the last class, be God. Or includes what we've heard in the last class. Be God. Place God everywhere. It's your reason for life. Your reason for this experience. To be the God of your universe. I am the light of the world. I am the food of the world. I am the love of the world. I am the wealth of the world. I am the harmony of the world. So let me get on with as my primary aspect of being or function or activity of being, being God as and to and for everywhere in my experience. I never have to consider what I sense to be my self. Never. Every time I do, I'm diving into a path of glue that slows me down. But by the degree I can keep away from what I sense as myself and in the one self, in God, and rest there and be satisfied with the experience of simply resting in God, feeling God happening, without any consideration for me, mine, I, personal sense of I, without any consideration for what the world appears to be doing or failing to do, without any consideration for what appears to be needed or not needed, then I will find myself not only filled with God, but filled with the copy, filled with the formation of truth. There's the way. Okay, I hope that's been helpful. Why don't we, because I'm feeling so much peace here, why don't we sit together and experience just God, forget about you, just be happy with and satisfied with feeling God happening.
Thank you. Thank you.